In this video, we're going to discuss some very interesting facts about context-free languages. Are they closed under union? Are context-free languages closed under concatenation? What about under intersection? And what about under complement? That is, given a context-free language, if you take its complement, is that also a context-free language? We're also going to ask about uh, the equivalence between context-free grammars. The first question to address is whether context-free languages are closed under union. Remember what union means. We're talking about set union. A language is a set of strings. So if you take two languages and you union them, um, is the result still a context-free language? Well, if it's a context-free language, the answer is yes, and we can prove it this way. If the two languages are context-free, then there must be a grammar to describe each of the languages. So there's a grammar to describe the first language, and it you know starts with some starting symbol and it's got a lot of rules. And there's some grammar to, to describe the second language, again with a lot of rules. Now to generate the um, language that's the union of these two languages, you just build a new grammar. And we have a new starting symbol and a new rule to combine the grammars this way. So yes, they are uh, closed under union. If you take two context-free languages and you union them, the result is context-free language. Now what about uh, concatenation? Again, the answer is yes. Remember what concatenation is. It's the set of all strings that you may, that, that can be uh, made from a part, the first part being from the first language and the second part being from the second language. So you take a string from the first language and you take a string from the second language and you concatenate them together. And the resulting string then is a member of the concatenated language. So if we take two context-free languages and we concatenate the languages, is the resulting set of strings also a context-free language? And the answer is yes. And the proof is to show how we can, can construct a context-free grammar for it. So again, we take the grammars for the first language and the second language, and we combine them together into one larger grammar with a new starting symbol and a new rule that just says, pick up something from the first language, and it should be followed by something from the second language. Now, just as a, a caveat to be careful, when we combine these two grammars, we better make sure that they have no non-terminals in common. So we can always take a grammar and we can rename the non-terminals to make sure that the non-terminals in grammar number one are completely distinct from the non-terminals in grammar number two. The next question to ask is whether context-free languages are closed under intersection. Remember that a language is a set of strings, and if we take two languages and we intersect those sets, is the result also a context-free language? And interestingly enough, the answer is no. It is not necessarily a context-free language. It may, of course, be, uh, but not necessarily. And here's a proof of, of why it's not the case that the intersection is uh, necessarily a context-free language. So let's look at two languages which are context-free, and we'll take the intersection of them, and uh, we'll see that it's not a context-free language. So there is a counterexample to prove that the answer to this question is no. So the first language we want to consider is called L1, and it consists of z a bunch of zeros, a bunch of ones, and a bunch of twos, where the zeros, the number of zeros is the same as the number of ones. 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the i, any number of twos. And here's a context-free grammar to prove that it's a context-free language. First, we can see that b goes to 2b or e. When you see this pattern, it's, uh, in this case, right recursion. Okay, You just expand using this rule over and over, and you get a sequence of twos. And finally, at the very end, you expand b into epsilon. So B goes to a string of zero or more twos. 
Then let's look at a. a goes to 0, a 1, so the number of zeros and the number of 1s always must be the same, with the zeros always coming before the 1s. So we've seen this pattern before, and this gives us 0 to the n, 1 to the n. And finally, s is the zeros and the 1s, that's a, followed by the 2s, that's b. The next language is very similar, L2, a bunch of zeros followed by a bunch of 1s, followed by a bunch of 2s. Only this time, the number of 1s is equal to the number of 2s. We have any number of zeros out front, followed by 1s and 2s. 0 to the k, 1 to the n, 2 to the n. Here's our grammar for that. S goes to AB, and this time A is a string of zeros. So here you have right recursion, and you have zero or more zeros. And B goes to the same pattern, 1, B, 2. So we have an equal number of 1s and 2s, with the 1s always to the left of the 2s. So these two languages are context-free. Now let's look at the intersection of these things. Okay? The intersection is the language 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n. In other words, in order to be in this language, the number of zeros has to be equal to the number of 1s. To be in this language, the number of 1s has to be equal to the number of 2s. To be in the intersection, we have to have both those, con those conditions met. So we have the same number of all three. We're not going to prove it here. I'm going to prove it later in, uh, when I talk about the pumping lemma. But we're going to prove there that this language is not context-free. So this is not a context-free language. The intersection is not a context-free language. So the answer to the question of whether the intersection of two context-free languages is a context-free language is no. Not in general. It, it is not in general. Of course, for some languages, the intersection may very well be context-free. But in general, the answer is no. The next question to address is whether context-free languages are closed under complement. In other words, when you take the complement of a language, is it also going to be context-free? When we take the complement of a language, it always has to be relative to uh, some universe. So we'll take it as a given that the universe is, is known. For example, we may be talking about um, the set of all strings over 0 and 1. Okay, so in that case, a language of strings with zeros and ones in it would be complemented within that universe to another set of strings of zeros and ones. So the question is, if you've got a context-free language and you take its complement, would that be also context-free? And the answer is, again, no. Okay, no in general, but possibly for some languages the answer is yes. And uh, we're now going to sketch out a quick proof of why that would be. First of all, remember that the languages are sets, okay? And so therefore, De Morgan's laws apply. Here's an example of one of De Morgan's laws. The intersection of A and B is just equal to the complement of the complement of A union with the complement of B. There's a similar law where you replace this with union and that with intersection. And you can move the knots around a bit too. You can knot both sides of an equation and the equation remains true. So if we drew a line over that, we'd have to erase this big line here. So our proof goes like this. Assume that context-free languages are closed under complement then the right-hand side okay, uh, would be closed. I mean, if A is a, a context-free language and B is a context-free language, and we're assuming that we can complement it, them, then the result of, of the complement, not A, would also be context-free. And the result of not B would be context-free. And the union, since we've shown that that's context-free, would also be context-free. And finally, we complement that, and again, it would be uh, context-free. So, if complement is context for, uh, uh, closed, then intersection would be closed. But we've just uh, shown that intersection of context-free languages is not closed, not necessarily context-free language. Therefore, we've got a contradiction. So that's our proof.
here's an interesting example. Um, here we have a language of WW, where W is a string of zeros and ones. So basically the first half of the strand, string is exactly like the second half of the string. It turns out this language is not context-free. Okay, we can remember things with our push-down automata, but it's always in a stack order. Okay, first in, first out. Uh, I'm sorry, first, last in, first out is a stack uh, order. So, in order to recognize this language, though, we need to remember things sort of in the order. We need to be able to sort of back up without losing our memory to the beginning of it and scan our memory again. And so, it turns out that L is not context-free. However, interestingly enough, the complement of this language is context-free. It's kind of hard to imagine what the complement of this is, but it's context-free. And it's also interesting to note that palindromes, okay, where the first half is equal to the second half, reversed, is a context-free language. This notation, W raised to the R, is not really a power thing. It doesn't mean repeat W. It means take W and reverse it. So this is the language of palindromes. The final question we want to address in this video is whether two grammars are equivalent. Equivalent means that they generate the same language. Okay, so if I give you two grammars and I ask you, do these two grammars generate the same language? Then I'm asking whether the two grammars are equivalent. In many cases, the answer is easy enough to see and you can examine the grammars and say, yep, they are clearly generating the same language or you can look at the grammars and say, no, uh, it's pretty obvious they're not. It's, it's completely provable that they're not generating the same language. But in general, uh, the answer is that this question is undecidable. Okay? Undecidable means that we can't uh, write a computer program to determine the answer. We can write the computer program, but I guess it's not a valid computer program because we can't guarantee that it will always halt. Any computer program to try to uh, determine whether two gr context-free grammars are equivalent may or may not halt. And let, I mean, let's, so this is, makes it a very interesting question. It's undecidable uh, in, uh, in general whether two context-free grammars will generate the same language. So maybe we can understand this by trying to write the program to determine whether two context-free grammars are the same. So let's say we're dealing with a, a, an alphabet, uh, uh, say, of zeros and ones. So we could generate every string in the universe. We could generate every string of zeros and ones. Now, there are infinitely many of them. They get longer and longer as we go along. But we, we can generate every string in turn. This is a never-ending process, but they are countably infinite, and we can generate them in some sort of order. And then for each string we generate, we can test. Is it accepted by grammar 1? And is it accepted by grammar 2? This question of whether it's accepted by grammar 1 is decidable. Okay, it's a decidable question whether a particular grammar accepts a particular string. We can just generate all the parse trees, all the possible derivations for strings of that length or shorter, until we and, and say, do we, do we, do we generate a, a parse tree for that string? So the question of whether a string is accepted or not by a particular grammar is decidable. We can write a program that, to do it and that program will always halt with an answer yes or no. Yes, that string is a part of the language generated by this grammar or no, it is not. So for each string of zeros and ones, we test. Is it accepted by grammar one? Yes or no. Is it accepted by grammar two? Yes or no. And we keep going along looking for a counterexample. If we find a counterexample when we have some string that's accepted by grammar one but not by grammar two, then we know that the two grammars are, are different. On the other hand, if it's accepted by grammar two but not by grammar one, again, the two grammars are not equivalent. But, and then we can halt and we say, well, we found a counterexample. These two grammars are not equivalent. But if the string is accepted by both grammars or not accepted by both grammars, then it doesn't tell us any new information. 
we just have to keep looking at the next string. So we just look at the next string of zeros and ones, and we keep on looking and looking at every string of zeros and ones, looking for a counterexample to prove they're not equivalent. But the problem is we never stop. We may not halt. Okay? Uh, there's no way to know when to stop looking for uh, that counterexample and declare that the two grammars are equal. So that's why, that's sort of a, an informal argument for why this is an undecidable question.